So we're getting into and completing the different types of reactions. So today is all about combustion reactions. And then we're going to talk about balancing chemical equations. Um, uh, and that'll probably end our discussion for uh, this week. So combustion reactions um, are reactions where we have some sort of substance that is reacting with oxygen. Um, we can call that burning. They are burning in oxygen. And the result of that combustion, of that burning, is heat and light. Those are the parameters. We're looking for oxygen as a reactant. And we are looking for heat and light coming off as a result of the reaction itself. Now, when our substances that are being burned are inorganic in nature, as is the case here for these three examples, we will see that the common products that are made are going to be oxides. In particular, if I have carbon, that is going to turn itself into carbon dioxide. And if I have something like hydrogen, hydrogen is going to turn itself into water. Now, those are not the only oxide products that can be made. And the last one gives us evidence of that. If I have ammonia, so I've got a nitrogen-based product, I'm going to get a nitrogen-based oxide as a result, nitrogen monoxide in this particular case. But more often than not, our combustion reactions are reactions involving carbon and hydrogen. And so the most common combustion products existing are carbon dioxide and water as a result. So if we review the five types of reactions then, starting at the very beginning, we had first, We had the uh, synthesis reaction, and that was all about putting together multiple reactants into a single product. We had the decomposition reaction. That was kind of the opposite process one reactant turning into multiple products. We had we had the replacement reactions, single and double, where atoms, either metal or nonmetal, switched places with each other to form new elements, new compounds. And then finally, we had the combustion reaction. And in the combustion reactions, we had those reactions with oxygen and things burning. So those were our primary types of reactions. Now we're going to get into a look of balancing. Now, balancing chemical equations is a relatively simple matter. What we are being driven by in the case of 
these chemical reactions. It's something called the law of conservation of matter. The law of conservation of matter says that in any chemical or physical process for that matter, matter can't be created or destroyed. It can only be reconfigured. So what that means from our standpoint of balancing is that every atom that goes into the reaction itself has to come out somewhere. Every atom of reactant needs to be accounted for in the products. And so from that standpoint, balancing equations becomes a matter of making sure that we have every single atom on both sides of the reaction and that there are no leftovers at the end of the process. So how do we go about doing that? Well, the primary way, probably, I don't know if I'd call it the easy way, but the primary way of doing that is something called the atom economy method. Now, the atom economy method is a relatively simple idea. We're going to take a chemical equation, split it up into reactants on one side and products on the other, and count up all the atoms of each kind of element on each side of that equation. By doing that, we will understand, okay, We've got six oxygens on each side, so that's okay, but we've got three carbons here and we've got five carbons here. We need to make a change somewhere. By keeping track of all of these things, we'll be able to see how we need to manipulate the equation. And using reaction coefficients, we'll change the numbers of each molecule to change the atoms and their ratios to each other until it comes out even on all sides. So that's the basis of the atom economy method. The atom economy method is chemical equation. We're going to split it down the middle. Reactants on one side, products on the other. Reactant side has this many of this element, this many of that element, this many of a third element. And how does that look on the product side? And based upon what's lacking in terms of equality, we'll fix it. Now, the process itself can be somewhat involved. There are some things that you can do that will help in making the process a little bit smoother, however. One of those things is to essentially reduce confusion. Hydrogen and oxygen are two of the most common elements in the world. And they're two of the most common elements in most chemical reactions. So the general rule of thumb that we use is to basically save them until we need them. Everything else, you might find, okay, there's carbon in one compound over here, and there's carbon in one compound over there. there. I can change those two compounds to get carbon to even out, however I need to do it. But if I've got hydrogen in this molecule, hydrogen in this molecule, and hydrogen in a molecule over here, it's going to be kind of difficult to figure out what I need to do to get the hydrogen balanced if it's not balanced already. And the same thing is true for oxygen. Oxygen is actually the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And it's because oxygen is so reactive with most of the metals that exist in the Earth's crust. So when you dig up the ground, you'll find oxides of iron and calcium, carbonates, and sulfates, and all sorts of other stuff. And all those have oxygen in them in some capacity. 
The other thing, and this applies particularly for replacement reactions, is clustering. Try to keep clusters of atoms together. I made note of something when we talked about replacement reactions. And that something I made note of was the fact that in replacement reactions, there are often entire groups of elements that end up doing nothing over the course of the reaction. I look at a reaction between silver nitrate and um, copper metal. And in the end, the copper and the silver do something, they switch places, but the nitrate ends up doing nothing. And since it doesn't actually react, it stays together as a nitrate ion. When we're balancing the equation, it's better to just keep it intact like that instead of breaking it apart into little bits. Because it's a lot harder to keep track of the little bits than it is to keep track of the single cluster. So again, this particular thing we see primarily in our replacement reactions. Doesn't show up too much anywhere else. But for replacement reactions, in particular double replacement reactions, this kind of, of use is very common. So let's get into some examples here. So here I've got an oxide of iron reacting with hydrogen to make iron metal and water. Now, the first question I would ask you in this is, what kind of chemical reaction is this? Of our five types, which one is this? It is single replacement. And how do we know that? We know that because what we're seeing is we've got hydrogen replacing the iron in the iron oxide. The reason it is single replacement as opposed to double replacement is because we only have one compound on each side. Hydrogen is an element, iron is an element. The only compounds in this equation are the iron oxide and the water. Now, setting up our atom economy, I'm gonna draw a line between the reactants and the products and using the chemical equation, I can see I have three irons on the reactant side. I have four oxygens on the reactant side. I have two hydrogens on the reactant side. And on the product side, the iron has no subscript and no coefficient. So that means it just has one. The hydrogen has two. And oxygen has no subscript and no coefficient. So it's one as well. So if I'm looking at it from that standpoint, right now, None of the elements are balanced other than the hydrogen. But for all we know, that could change over the course of time also. So what we need to do is we need to start to look at balancing the equation by using coefficients. Now, coefficients are those numbers on the outside of the chemical formula. I can't change the chemical formula itself. So for the three irons here, I can't just put a three right here I can't put a three right there to fix it. I can't put a four right here to fix this. Reason I can't do that is because those are chemicals. They have a chemical identity. 
That chemical identity is tied to the ratio of one element to the others. And so when we're trying to balance equations, we're not going to use subscripts. We're going to use coefficients. Now, one of the easy ways to get that coefficient train started is I can see that my iron oxide here has multiple subscripts. One of the easiest ways to get the whole thing started is to take those subscripts and turn them into coefficients on the other side of the equation. That is usually a pretty good starting place for the overall process. So I'm gonna put a three here next to my iron. I'm going to put a four here next to my water. And if I do that, my numbers over here on the products are going to change. That's okay. We just wanna make sure that they change by the right amount. So I had one iron here, that's now three because the coefficient of three multiplied by the implied subscript of one here, three times one gives me three. For the water, four times one gives me four. For the hydrogen, this one is gonna change now, four times two is gonna give me eight. So, I have effectively balanced the iron and the oxygen. Those are balanced now. The hydrogen got thrown out of balance in the balancing of the other two. Luckily, though, fixing that's not too terribly difficult either because I now need eight hydrogens, and I've got two for every molecule. Eight divided by two would give me four water molecule, or excuse me, four hydrogen molecules. Four times two is eight. Now I have eight of each. All of my atoms, all of my elements are now balanced. My equation is balanced now as well. So there is a process that you have to go through here. If you're unfamiliar, if you haven't done chemistry in a really long time, or if this is your first ever exposure to balancing chemical equations, this is probably going to take you a little bit of time to get used to initially. However, as time goes on, as you do more examples, as you get into this more frequently, what you'll find is the need to do this kind of tracking becomes less and less and less. At some point, you'll end up being able to do things by what we call inspection, where instead of writing down all of the atoms, you'll be able to look at it and go, okay, I can see that needs a three, that needs a four, four comes back over here, it's balanced. Now, that particular process takes some time to get to. If you ever get stuck, though, you can always fall back on this, this kind of accounting to get you in the right direction. All right, let's do another example. What kind of reaction, <clears throat> excuse me, what kind of reaction do we have here in example two? It is not double replacement. Okay. So we've got oxygen reacting with something. We're making carbon dioxide and water. Those are kind of the telltale markers of combustion. So this is a combustion reaction. Now, <clears throat> I will say out of personal experience, 
combustion reactions are probably the most difficult to balance because there are lots of little tricks and tips and little kinds of side tracks that you can get down into because of all the variety of different products that can be made out of them. But we can start with the same kind of premise that we had before. Four carbons, we're gonna turn that into four carbon dioxides. 10 hydrogens, we're gonna turn those into 10 waters. And we'll see where that takes us. So we've changed carbon. Four times one now is four. Hydrogen, 10 times two is now 20. Oxygen, four times two is eight plus another 10 gives us a total of 18. Okay, so we're, we're okay, other than we've got a couple of little snags here. We balanced the carbon, but we really didn't balance anything else. Before we get to the oxygen, we're gonna to need to address the hydrogen. Again, we're always saving carbon and hydrogen for, la or excuse me, oxygen and hydrogen for last. And of those two, we definitely want to save oxygen for last because as you can see here, oxygen is in three of the four compounds. Sean? Okay, we could. So if we had done that, um, following Sean's suggestion here. If we had done that, we got a 10 here. This would be a five instead. We would have ended up in this spot right here. Carbon and hydrogen are balanced. Oxygen is not. Now the problem here that we're going to run into with the oxygen is that on the product side, we've got an odd number. On the reactant side, our oxygen's only come in evens. So the only way that we could solve this problem conceivably would be to use a fraction, 13 halves. 13 halves times two would give us 13. And that would solve the problem, but Fractional coefficients don't make a whole lot of sense. After all, what does half of a molecule look like? So if you find yourself in this spot, the easiest way to get out of it is you just double everything. So if I double everything, then I've got a two here. I've got, instead of 13 halves, I would have 13, this would become eight, and this would be the 10 that we had originally. And that would balance everything out along the way. So that is one way to do it. One, one of the good things about balancing equations is that there are multiple approaches that can be taken and still get us to the right, right spot. But let's, let's go back to where we were just a second ago. So we were here, we had four carbon dioxides and 10 waters. That gave us four carbons, 20 hydrogens and 18 oxygens. Now, if we address the hydrogen problem, we know that we're gonna to need to double that, um, that uh, butane there. Doubling the butane takes care of the hydrogen problem. 
but it creates a new problem in terms of the carbon. So we've got the hydrogens taken care of, but now we've got the, ox the uh, carbons to worry about. We now have eight carbons instead of four. So we're gonna have to change this guy to an eight. That means now we have eight carbons. We also have a new amount of oxygens, 16 from the carbon dioxide, eight times two, plus these 10 more is 26 in total. And here's where our 13 comes in on the other side. The long point here is you get there the same way. Now, doing that subscript to coefficient thing that I showed you in the first example and that we used here, it is a little bit more of a roundabout way. You have to change some of the coefficients multiple times to get it. But it works in the sense that you never have to make a fractional coefficient. Um, if you're better with math, you can usually figure out the fractions pretty easily. You just have to make sure that you multiply by a number big enough to get rid of all of the fractions. So it really comes down to what's your comfort level with math? What are you capable of doing relatively easily? Balancing the equation should always be something that you can do in your head. The mathematics should never be something where you have to pull out a calculator to make sure that your numbers are right. So if you're not good with doing that kind of mental math, I would stick to the, the kind of trial and error method that we're, that we're showing here. Put in a number, see how it changes things, change another number, see how that changes things until you start to get to the correct combination of, of numbers. All right, any questions with this example? Yara? For the oxygen? So we had in carbon dioxide, we have eight carbon dioxides and every carbon dioxide has two oxygens. So that gives me 16. And in the water, we have 10 waters, and every water gives me one oxygen. So that gives me 10. 16 plus 10 gives me the 26. And so on the flip side, I had 13 times 2 to give me that same 26. All right, other questions? All right, another example. All right, here we have an example of a replacement reaction. The question is what kind of replacement reaction are we talking about? All right, this is a double replacement. And the reason we know that it is double replacement is because We are talking about two compounds on either side switching stuff. So we can look at this as we have potassium switching places with barium to make two new compounds, the potassium chloride and the barium sulfate. So the switching places makes it a replacement reaction. The fact that we have two compounds on each side, no elements, two compounds, would give us the double part of the double replacement. Now, as I mentioned before, in replacement reactions, in particular double replacement reactions, we usually end up having stuff that doesn't really change a whole lot. So we can see in this case, the sulfate, SO4, is consistent on both sides of the reaction. So instead of tr monitoring individual sulfurs and individual oxygens, because there is that consistency on both sides, we are going to monitor individual sulfate ions 
on each side of the equation. That's going to make things a little bit more simple for us because it means that we have one less thing to keep track of. And the numbers are going to be smaller as a result as well. Instead of going and looking at four oxygens per sulfate, we're now looking at just one sulfate in total. So if we started off from our economic standpoint, I've got two potassiums on the reactant side. I've got one sulfate on the reactant side, one barium, two chlorines. On the product side, I've got one potassium, one sulfate, one barium, and one chlorine. Now, double replacement reactions are probably the easiest to balance. And the reason why they're usually the easiest to balance is because, well, since we've got so much common clustering going on and there isn't a whole lot of rearranging taking place, we usually have pretty good agreement between groups of atoms and each other. And so we can see that in this case, the barium and the sulfate are already balanced. The only thing that is out of balance is the potassium and the chlorine, which wouldn't you know it, are in the same compound on that side of the equation. And so I can look across and see they're off by the same amount on both sides. So balancing is actually a real bit of a snap here. Putting a two there, takes care of the potassium and the chlorine and there's nothing else to do. So again, replacement reactions tend to be the easiest to balance as a result because there isn't a whole lot that goes into them. They're usually pretty easy to monitor because we do see a lot of grouping together. And because there are those common groupings, they don't all come out this easy, but usually we will get to a point after one or two manipulations where we come to this spot where we've got two ions that are both off by the same amount and are in the same compound on the side of the reaction that we're trying to fix. All right, we've got another double replacement reaction here. And we've got more clustering, you can see. We've got carbonates and nitrates on both sides of the reaction. But we can see again, carbonate and magnesium are already balanced. The only things that are out of balance are the sodium and the nitrate in the products, which happen to be in the same product here. We are going to solve it exactly the same way that we did the previous problem. A two in either in a two there in that spot will solve the sodium problem and the nitrate problem at the same exact time. All right, questions about either example three or example four. Okay, All right. rather than um, go and completely do this yourselves, um, since we only have five minutes, let's peel off one of these here and do it together. And then we'll start Monday kind of reviewing and do the other three. So let's pick off um, this first one. So 
This is a combustion reaction. See if you can figure out what the balancing looks like for this combustion reaction. Um, so write it down on a piece of paper, split the reaction in half, try to figure out the balance. All right, we've got about two minutes left. Let's go ahead and try to work this out. So, okay. So the correct answer here would have been a five for the carbon dioxide, a six for the water, and an eight on the oxygen. How do we get there? Well, using our pentane here as a guide, we know that we're going to need five carbon dioxides to give us five carbons. So that's going to take care of that part. And to get our 12 hydrogens, we're going to need six waters. Now, if you did my carryover, the coefficients thing, 
Um, you would have gotten to pretty much the same spot, but everything would end up being doubled. You would have had two, 16, 10, and 12. And that's okay, uh, but generally speaking, we usually have our, our balanced equation coefficients in kind of lowest terms. So if every coefficient can be divided by three, we divide them all by three. If they all need, can be divided by two, we divide them all by two. But anyway, if we, if we finish this off, this gives us our 12. We have five times two, which is 10, plus six times one, which is six. So we've got 16 oxygens. And so we would need eight oxygen molecules to give us the 16. Now, again, if you did the carryover and you had a 12 on the water initially, it would have worked. Um, you would have just ended up having to pretty much double everything as you went through. Again, that's fine. It's technically balanced but you don't find too many equations that can be divided out because it, it kind of becomes unnecessary at some point. So we will do the other three as kind of a warm up on Monday, and then we'll get into the rest of chapter five. Have a great weekend.